So today's message title is Humility. Humility, all right? And this is going to, as we read through that chunk of scripture, you're probably like, wow, that's a lot, right? And it is a lot. There's a lot of huge, weighty, awesome topics all packed in here. And I will tell you this, that my pastor, Pastor Robert Furrow of Calvary Tucson, last week on Friday after I was kind of done with my notes, and if you remember last week we talked about Israel um, there's a lot of stuff going on in Israel. Hopefully you got some of the resources I sent you because there's more stuff that's gone on and going on in Israel and around there. And I don't got time to get into that. But I looked up my pastor's um, old teachings. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to see what Robert has. And you know what he did? The last week's text that I wanted to cover, he had like five teachings on those 12 verses alone. All right? And I started listening to him. I said, I'm, I'm doomed. There's no way I'm going to be able to do one teaching on this. And today I'm doing even more than that because I want to keep us on track for a Christmas series I hope to do. But here's the thing, we're going to talk about humility. Now, the dictionary or the world will have its own definition of humility, and really it's this, a modest or low view of oneself. And that's part of it, but this is what I want to um, present to you today. Humility defined by the Bible through example, through different ways that the Hebrew and Greek words are used. I mean, it means humble, it means meek, it means gentle. And the Bible, here's the thing, that it expresses humility as a quality that stands in direct contrast to pride. So if you want to understand humility, you need to understand pride. If you want to understand pride, you need to understand humility because you see and you understand the effect if you actually see and understand both. They're polar opposites. And so we're going to look at pride a bit today. We're going to look at humility. And you need to understand this in general. This is a generalization. There's two main worldviews, right? There's two main worldviews. The one worldview, that's a fancy word, anthropocentric. It's hard to say. Um, But anyways, that's one worldview, and really that's the world's worldview. And the way that they would view the world, their their existence, they consider humanity as the most significant entity of the universe, and therefore everything revolves around humans, their desires, whatever they want, because it's all about them anyways. That's the worldview of the world, right? That's very general um, in sense. And then there's the other worldview, which is, this is a generic um, one, but the main other one is a theocentric worldview, which means that you believe in a God and the whole universe and all everything that exists revolves and exists for God. And now to understand pride and humility a bit, you got to understand that each worldview views these things differently. The world, in their worldview, they view humility as a weakness. Humility is weak. It's sad. Um, you don't be humble. You don't let people walk all over you. It's not a good look, right, to the world. In the world, though, they view pride as a strength. The opposite for the theocentric or the Christian for us here today is that we should view humility as one of the greatest strengths. And pride is one of the greatest weaknesses, if not the greatest of them all. Right, And so there's so much that revolves around pride in the world. And if you just think about it for a minute, it totally makes sense. Right? You're like, well, you know what? What do you mean? Well, here's some examples. Right? It's like the world is so prideful about everything, and they're almost prideful about their pridefulness. If you're not like prideful about what you're prideful about, like you're not about it. A couple examples. Pride for America. I know some of you are like, whoa, Nick, easy there. Um, but it's like pride for America. We're going all overboard so that everybody knows. Going one further, pride for sports teams, right? It's like, hey, let them know who you root for, hook them horns, whatever they say. I don't know. I don't prescribe to that. Although the D-backs are in the uh, it's baseball. They, you guys laugh, man. I got faith. They're going to pull it off, maybe, hopefully. But it doesn't matter because I don't have pride in them. I got, got my faith in Jesus, baby. Some other examples, though. Pride for sexuality. Just go watch the news. Go to downtown Austin and see if you don't see pride for sexuality, your sexual preference, and whatever you want all over the place. Your pride, There's this is another one, politically charged one. Pride for your choice to abort a baby or not, right? They're so proud about that. There's pride for literally anything and everything you want, except being a Christian, Go out there and talk about Jesus like, hey, I'm proud to be a follower of Jesus because he died for me, he bled for me, and I have received his salvation. People don't want to hear that, but anything else, sure. Be proudful about being a drug addict or whatever. It doesn't even matter. The world will accept you because the world revolves around pride. Pride is 
all the world has. Right? They have nothing else. They don't have hope. They don't have salvation of eternity. They don't have something to look forward to. So literally the here and now and the pridefulness of what they have is all that they really have. And so you take away pride, well, then life is meaningless to them because they don't know God. They don't know Jesus. The theocentric worldview, again, is op- the opposite of that. Right? God's the reason we're here. He's the reason we're living and breathing. He made us for Him, by Him, on purpose, with a purpose. And a news flash here is that God has made us to love Him and to love others, as we've described a couple weeks ago when Paul was telling us, like, hey man, you got to have loyalty to Jesus and you got to have unity with one another. Have the same mind. Have the same spirit. Serve the one faith. There's not multiple faiths. There's one God, one spirit, one faith. And man, you got to be united there. And so God has made us to love Him first and foremost and to love others. And to do that, we got to have humility. It's not a question. It's not on the table or up for discussion. Or You know what, Nick? I don't really want to have a humble spirit. And I just got to say this, that if that's you, if that's your thought, if, if you go that route, it's a very dangerous route, right? The Bible has much to say about the prideful. All right, some of you think, well, it's not a big deal. I'm proud I'm, and not a big deal, Nick. It's not as hardcore as you, you think. But I would say you're wrong in that, right? See, the Bible's full of different examples by way of destruction that comes from pride, right? There's destruction because pride is sinful. Here, if you want to jot down notes, there's going to be a lot of stuff we're going to hit today and that you might want to write down or look up later. Um, But here is something you need to know. Pride is the root of all sin. Pride is the root of all sin. Doesn't matter what it is. Tell me a sin and I'll be, and we can say it, it results from pride, right? Drunkenness. It's like, I'm going to do what I want to do. That's pride. Don't tell me I can't drink. That's pride, right? It's like, okay, obviously sexual immorality, adultery, things of that. That's pride because you're going to do whatever you want to do, regardless of what happens to the other person. If you're married, your spouse, right? Talk about greed. That's pride because I'm going to do what I want to do to make myself better, right? Anything and everything sin-wise revolves around pride, and the root of it all is pride. Pride is the number one contributor to every sin. Even self-pity is pride. It is sin, right? Think about it. Self-pity, oh, woe is me, life is hard, why does everybody else get to have this and I don't? It's because you think you deserve what other people have, and so in that, that thinking, that's pride. And pride is a sin. The Bible tells us pretty much all these examples, anything of sin, we can result to pride. But here's a few of them. Adam and Eve, it was sin. They wanted, they desired it because they thought that they could be like God. They believed and bought the lie from Satan. Right? Moses is a good example of pride in his pre-Israelite days when he was actually working for Pharaoh. Right? He killed a man. Is in a pride that he's thinking he's doing the right, the noble thing. And then what happens is they actually find out and then Moses flees into the wilderness for a long time before God actually meets him and calls him. Then in Moses' Israelite days, when he's actually leading the Egyptian or not the Egyptians, the Israelites, sorry, that's weird. Um, but anyways, there, he's leading the Israelites. And then there's a moment where God tells him specifically, speak to the rock and then the water will come out, right? He tells him, speak to it. Well, the thing is, beforehand, a couple, I don't know how long before, but there was an instance where God said, strike the rock and then water came out. And so anyways, he tells them this time, speak to the rock. But Moses was frustrated. People are complaining, and he doesn't want to have it anymore. And he's had it up to here, Lord, why am I here? And all they do is grumble and complain, and then he needs water, so he just strikes the rock, because he just thinks, well, it works. This worked last time. I'm going to do it again. Well, in doing that, it was disobedience. It was a, a motive of anger, which is a, the root of it, pride. Some other people we can name from the Bible, King Nebuchadnezzar, he quite literally made a statue of himself and made people worship him. Talk about pride, right? It's like when you think about, well, what could be more prideful? Obviously, King Nebuchadnezzar, that is one instance of many. King David, maybe some of you are familiar with him. King David, David and Bathsheba, you guys heard this story before, right? David was the king. Um, And then he looks out his window and he sees a woman taking a bath, right? It's Bathsheba, very fitting there. And so then David said that he wanted her to come over. And the next thing you know, he sleeps with her. He commits adultery with another man's wife, pride, 
taking what's not yours, thinking that, well, I'm the king, I can do whatever I want. That's kind of his thinking. But to add to it, he, King David calls Uriah back because Bathsheba became pregnant. If you know the story, right? It's like, oh, whoops, my sin didn't go as planned. All of a sudden, now there's this, um, this baby in the picture. So David brings Uriah in it. He thinks in his pride he can cover his sin, right? It's like, let's get the husband back over. We're going to get him some wine. He's going to get a little drunk. He's going to feel good, and we're going to send him home to his wife to make love with her, and then it will look like it's her or his baby. How sinful and messed up is that? King David, the man after God's own heart. We're all like, David was a man after God's own heart. David was messed up, and he's, he had pride. Right? And to make it worse, right, he brings him over. Uriah was a stand-up dude. He's like, uh, he, he's like drunk, and you know, most people be like, yeah, I'll go home and see my wife. I haven't seen her in a while, and you know, we're going to hang out, if you know what I mean. And then, um, but Uriah's like, I'm not going to go home to my wife. Like, my, my fellow soldiers are at war, at battle. And so he ends up sleeping, like, on the steps outside, right? Because Uriah was so stand-up of a dude. Well, David, in his pride, to make it even worse, he sends him back to battle. David says, hey, all, everyone back up from the front line, leave Uriah out in front. And really what he was doing was say, saying, let him be killed. So Uriah not only took another man, or David not only took another man's wife, he took another man's life in his pride. And then this, to make it even worse, right, David trying to be the hero. Nobody knows that he slept with her yet, right? Uh, and he, he sees this poor, innocent, pregnant widow and brings her in, right? Trying to make himself look like the good guy. I'll take care of you. Anyways, talk about pride. It's pride. It's an example of pride. Other examples of pride, the Pharisees in the New Testament in Jesus' day, they were religious leaders. They're the people who thought they're more holy, more righteous than any. Peter, one of the disciples, right, in his pridefulness, he said, Jesus, even if everybody leaves you, I will never deny you. We ride together, die together, Jesus. No one's coming between us. Well, not long later, Peter's seen actually denying Jesus, not once, not twice, but three times. And meanwhile, Jesus is being beaten, whipped, and sent to the cross. Talk about pride. He thought that he wouldn't fall, he wouldn't betray Jesus, but he does, right? And the greatest of them all, I guess, example-wise, is the pride of Satan, the devil himself. He's the number one contributor to pride. He was the first one to have that pride. And it says in the Bible, in the Old Testament, that he wanted to make himself like the Most High. That was Satan's job, right? God made him beautiful, amazing. He was wise, powerful, maybe even one of the most powerful beings of all other than God himself. And it says that in his pride, that he traded his wisdom to try and gain something that wasn't his. That he tried to make himself like the Most High. And now the Bible tells us that God is going to one day, not, he already cast him out of heaven. And then one day he will actually throw him in the lake of fire. And it's going to be over with. Pride is all over the Bible because pride is at the root of every sin. It's all over our lives as well. But the, some more examples of pride. I'm going to blast through these scriptures here. But if you're like, okay, those are some examples. They don't necessarily say the word pride. David, in his pride, got Bathsheba. But here's some ones that you cannot dispute with at all. Proverbs 11.2 says, When pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with the humble is wisdom. Proverbs 16.5 says, Everyone who is arrogant or prideful, we could say, in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit or an arrogant spirit before a fall. Proverbs 18, 12, before destruction, a man's heart is haughty or arrogant or prideful, but humility comes before honor. James 4, 6, but he gives more grace. It says, therefore, he says, God opposes the proud. I want you to write that down. If you have, take notes. God opposes the proud. You got to know that today when we're talking about humility and we're talking about pride. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. James 4.10 says, Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Peter says a very similar thing, the same thing actually, quoting the same scripture that James quotes. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble in 1 Peter 5. 
And so I hope that you're understanding and catching the whole point here is pride is destructive, deceitful, it's poisonous. And you got to know this about pride because it's so sneaky because pride feels good. And that's the biggest thing that sucks about it. And humility hurts. And that's the biggest thing that sucks about humility. But the thing is, pride feels good here and now, but you will suffer long-term consequences. The humility hurts now, but you will reap long-term rewards. Jesus says, it kind of makes more sense when Jesus says this, Matthew 16, verse 25 and 26. You'll be familiar with this when I read it, but it says, For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? Right? Like, if you gain the whole world, right? The world's out there, and they're, they're prideful. They're proud about it. Right? And that's their life. That's everything they have. But Jesus is like, what good is it if you get everything and you lose your soul? Right? You can have all the money in the world. And honestly, it's kind of interesting because you look at people who have a lot of money, like celebrities who will probably never meet. Do they look like happy? Like when you look at more news things like sure in the movie or at the award show, things look fine. But why is there so many people who overdose? Why is there so many people who take their own life in these these um, in that caliber of celebrities? They got it all. Well, why are they so miserable? And Jesus is like, what good is it to gain everything and you're going to lose your soul and eternity? Going back to that point, God opposes the proud. Pride literally positions us against God. Right? God opposes the proud. Whether we realize it or not, when we are prideful, proudful, what, how do I say that? I don't know, that sounds weird. When we are proud, proud. When we are proud. <laughs> I'm having one of those moments, and I'm like, what? Proud, pride, proud, proud. Sounds weird. But anyways, whether we realize it or not, we're picking a fight with God. And you need to understand that. God doesn't want to fight with you. He loves you. He sent his son to die for you so that you could have salvation. But when we are proud, we're picking a fight with God. Right? It says that God opposes the proud. And so what that means is like when we are proud, what we are doing is we're in the ring and we're and God's in the corner against you. Let me just tell you, you don't want to fight with God. Right? He has a way of, uh, of getting you. He will humble you. And it's not usually fun. It hurts. Right? But it says with the humble, God, God will exalt the humble. Humility puts God in your corner. Humility positions God with you. Right? And so today's text, I know we got to get into this real quick, right? Is all about humility. And you got to understand it. And so when we got to understand humility, we got to understand pri- pride. Man, I don't even know how to say it anymore. <laughs> I'm going to be messed up. But you know what I mean. But it's all about humility. And we got to understand if you want to follow Jesus, you got to start with humility. You cannot receive the gospel without first humbling yourself and seeing your need for the gospel. Right. If you want to have unity in the church, as Paul talks about, right, and he's going to talk more about it today, you got to have humility so that we can serve one another and work with one another. If you want to be lights in this dark world and you want to go out and make a difference in the world, you need humility. If you want to make a big impact with your life for Jesus, you need humility. And so let's dive in. Verse one It says, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. And so if you remember what he wrote, I mean, this would have been two weeks ago, three weeks ago, right? He's like, let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel. And if you remember that teaching we talked about, you got to have loyalty to Jesus, number one, first and foremost. If you don't have that, everything else doesn't really matter. you got to have loyalty to Jesus, but then we need to have unity with one another. we got to care for one another. And Paul's he's just going on with this whole statement, right? This whole idea, and he says that at the end of chapter 1, and he's going on, if there's any encouragement in Christ. And I think if they're reading it, they'd be like, yeah, there is. 
If I asked you guys, is there any encouragement in Christ amongst us? I hope we would say, yeah, there is. We're not perfect. We don't have it all together, but we could say God's doing something here. There's encouragement here. Is there any comfort from love? Is there any love going on? Do we care about each other? Is there any participation in the Spirit? Are we following the Holy Spirit's lead? Are we feeling convicted? And when we feel convicted, do we repent of our sins? Because the Spirit is the one who convicts us of our sins. Is there any move of the Spirit, any affection, any sympathy? And he says, if there is, he's like, complete my joy by being of the same mind. If there is, be, be of the same mind. And he says, having the same love, being in full accord. And he says it again, and of one mind. Right? He's, and I think he's leading up to what we're going to get to. And the one mind, the same mind, is the mind of Christ. If you take notes, what mind should we have? We should have the mind of Christ. What kind of love should we have? He says the same level. We should have the agape, sacrificial love. Right? We want to be in full accord. What that means is we want to be in sync. We want to be in unity or tandem or what could we say? In harmony. Right? I just think of a I was thinking of examples and I don't know if this makes sense to you guys, but a truck, like a truck, everything is in unison, or at least it should be. Right? There's so many moving parts and it's only going in one direction. Right? If the front tires could go forward and the back ones could go backwards or working against each other, you wouldn't get anywhere. But oftentimes that's what the church looks like. And Paul's like, you got to be in full accord. You got to be of one spirit, one mind, and you got to be going in one direction, the direction that God is calling you to go. Because again, like a truck, it's like it can't go two ways and it only goes one. But just think of all the little things that can make a car or a truck not drive as well as it should. I mean, the battery for one, right? It's like, again, we're talking about the body of Christ. We're many members, but we're one body, right? A truck is many parts, but one vehicle, if you will. I right? just think about it. When you go to buy a new car or something, you go to the car lot, like nobody pops the hood to look at the battery and says, oh man, look at that battery. Man, that's a sweet battery. Nobody cares, right? But without the battery, you wouldn't be able to start that thing and go anywhere, right? Very similarly, like if you pop the hood, like you'd be like, well, is the timing chain good? You really, in most vehicles, you can't see the timing chain. But without the timing chain, you're, or if it's not even calibrated correctly, everything will, it'll misfire. And in some vehicles, here's a fun fact that if the timing chain breaks, it will actually ruin your engine. <laughs> Just a, a fun fact. Because what happens is then all of a sudden, these valves aren't on the timing they should be, and then they get bent and all this stuff. And um, but something so small can ha be so catastrophic, and it has to work perfectly. Tires, right? Think of the tires on a car or a truck. They got to be inflated properly. They got to be properly balanced, properly aligned. Because if they're not, what happens? Well, it's a bumpy ride. You might be able to get somewhere, but it's like, man, why is this thing doing this the whole time down the, the toll road, right? It's got to be some of you like, I don't know, whatever. Your vehicle is probably good, so you know, but. When one of those wheel weights fall off your tire on a big tire, it makes a huge difference. All of a sudden, you're like, what's going on? And then you go to discount tire, and they put a little, you know what I'm talking about, the little weights on there. All of a sudden, you're like, that's it? And it drives smoothly. You're like, man, it's amazing what fine-tuning can happen. And we're the body of Christ, and we are to work together. And some of you, man, you might not like it, right? But maybe you're the battery, right? And you're like, but I don't want to be the battery. No one cares about the battery. It's like, but literally without you, we can't even get started. Right? You think, like, well, I want to be something else, man. I want to be the steering wheel. It's like, well, literally, you have a role to play. Without the battery, we can't go anywhere, right? Some of you, you might feel like the tires, man, I'm just carrying such a heavy burden. And I feel like everyone's just relying on me. Maybe so, but maybe that's what God's called you to do, because without you, we wouldn't go anywhere. We'd just be, we'd have the battery, we could start up, but now we're just sitting around. What should we do? Man, I don't know. We can't get anywhere, right? It's like, you're the fuel to the fire. We got to go, right? Every part of the body of the church matters. You have a role to play in the church. You have a role to play in this church, right? Maybe, again, does, I don't know what your role is, but I hope that we can we could find it. But you got to know that we're to be in unity, in full accord, is what he's saying, in sync with one another, like a car that's properly tuned so that we can go in one direction. We wouldn't have all kinds of things go wrong, not that things won't go wrong, but here's something too. When you're thinking about a church to join, whether it's our church or another one, you do want to know, like, am I going to be able to be in sync with this church? Because every church has, like, different styles or flavors. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's almost like going to a restaurant. They all serve food. Hopefully churches 
for the most part, we're serving the gospel, but some people do it differently. Some of them do it real big and fancy. Some of them do it a little more chill and relaxed. Some people are more charismatic. Some people are more conserved and whatever, and that's fine, but as long as we're preaching the gospel. But when you're looking for a church, you've got to understand, number one, you should be in a church. I do believe it's biblical that you're to be part of a local church body somewhere, somehow, some way. Right? When you come into the fervent church, you're like, well, what do you guys believe? What, all that. Like, you can go watch literally, what, a month or two ago, we had Fervent 101, a two part series where we talk about it. Go listen to it and then come back and, and ask yourself the question Do I want to be a part of this church? Can I serve here? Do I agree with everything that they do? Because that's what you got to ask. Right? Because if you want me to be like somebody else, like, that you're like, man, you know what? They got a really awesome ministry. And I'm like, I'm not that person. Right, and that's that's. I think that's okay. I'm not going to try to be someone God hasn't made me to be. Uh, I mean, I don't want you to be someone God hasn't made you to do. So I uh, I want you to know that you have a role to play in the church, whether it's here or somewhere else. But here's something to think about: it's like when you feel a stirring of God and you think, well, maybe it doesn't fit in this church. I want to just maybe ask this question: maybe God's stirring you up to be the answer to that thing. Right? You're like, oh man, it'd be really cool if we do this ministry. You know how many people have come up to me or, or I've heard in it's at our old church. It's a big church, right? There's 7,000 plus people that would come on a weekend, five different services, big church, right? And there's like 10 pastors for 7,000 people. It's ridiculous. Like how, there's no way. If everyone came down for prayer, we'd be here for a week. <laughs> um, but um, anyways, people would say, you know, it'd be really cool is if we would do this. And what they meant by if we do this, they're like, you should do this. Like, hey, if we had this ministry, and I think those things can be good, but I want to say this, like maybe God's stirred it up in you, given you that vision so that you have a role to play in that church. You know what I'm saying? It's like maybe we can't currently do it because we don't have the people, but you have this vision, and maybe you're the person that we've been waiting for so that we can start it. You know what I'm saying? Maybe you're the answer to that prayer to make it happen. But anyways, moving on, he says, verse 3, he says, Do nothing from selfish ambition, or do no thing, nothing at all, from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Humility, it's essential. We need it. He says, do nothing, no things. I mean, that's literally like, well, what about this? No. But what about, no, nothing, no things out of selfish ambition. And you know what selfish ambition is. It's just selfishness, right? It's pride manifested in just like, I just care about myself and all I'm trying to do is build my wealth, my life, my way, whatever. He says, do nothing from selfish ambition. That's the world, right? The world, and that's what makes it hard as a Christian because we look at the world and we're like, but they're doing it. And Paul's like, don't, don't do it. I think it's even a little bit of him referring back to what he said in Philippians 1.17 where he says that the former, they actually preach Christ out of selfish ambition seeking to afflict me in my chains. Right? I think he's referring back to that a bit. He's like, that's them. That's not you. That's not for us. Doing things out of selfish ambition, that's not what we're called to do. Do no things, nothing from selfish ambition. And he says even... and. Um, or conceit. The word conceit means vain glory. I think it's a great word study, man, and I was, um, it's good, but I don't have time to get super deep into it, but I'll say this, that it's vain glory. And it reminds me of one specific book in the Bible, maybe it reminds you of one, but it's the book of Ecclesiastes. It's written by King Solomon. Solomon is King David's son, or one of them, and King Solomon is said to be the wisest person other than Jesus himself, Whoever lived, he prayed for wisdom. God gave him wisdom to lead his people. And Solomon was wise. He wrote most of the Proverbs. He wrote Ecclesiastes. He wrote um, Song of Solomon, right? Um, did he write anything else? Said it. Anyways, he's a wise guy, but he writes Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes will probably do a study in the next year or so. But man, it's basically a science experiment where Solomon says that I'm just going to put myself out there I'm going to test everything that the world has to offer. I'm going to test parties, sex, drinking. I'm going to build stuff. I'm going to do great things. I'm going to see if any of these things would fulfill and satisfy. And his end result, if you've read it, you know this. He says it's all vanity, chasing after the wind. 
And Solomon is not only one of the wisest people who ever lived, he's one of the most wealthy people. It's said that in comparison that he would be far wealthier than Bill Gates today in comparison of wealth. We're talking like he had stuff at his, he could just, whatever he wanted. Right? New house, sure. Mansion, let's get 10 of them. Right? He had what is, he have 700 wives and 300 concubine or something. Literally this dude, I'm serious. And like he went out to say, Let's see if relationships and sexual pleasure fulfills. And Solomon says it's worthless. And, and at the end of his whole experiment, he says, the end matter is this, fear God and keep his commandments. The only thing that matters is, is a relationship with the Lord. Right? And so when we're talking about selfish ambition and vain glory, you got to understand, Solomon's gone out there, lived it, done that, and he's trying to tell us, don't waste your time chasing things that won't satisfy. It's vain glory. Worthless glory. Sure, it lasts for a second. You feel like you have status, but in the end, Jesus is like, you gain the world, yet you lose your soul. It's worthless. It wasn't worth it. Vain glory. It says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. That's, that's the word. That's what we need to know. Count others more significant than yourselves. That's hard. Right? We're talking about like when you're driving down the toll road. Someone wants to get in. Come on, you all know what I'm talking about. All right, they put their blinker on. Or there are those people who are like, you've been the nice guy. I'm going to wait in line right here. I know I could go right on the, the shoulder of the road and get in front of people and do that. But who does that? I'm a Christian. I'm better than that. right? But then you see the guy do it anyways around you. And then, at least this is me, I'm like, I'm not letting you in, man. You didn't obey the laws. <laughs> like, literally, you're cheating, man. You could have gotten in line with everybody else. Right, but literally, part of it's like count others, um, or in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. And so there's times when I'm driving, and that stuff makes me upset. This is just a small example, and I'm like, you know what? I don't want to let you in, but I'm going to let you in anyways because I'm going to consider you more significant than me. But you're a little more impatient than me too. So whatever, maybe you got somewhere to go. Um, you know what I mean? Who knows what's going on in someone's life? Um, but anyways, that's an example. But counting others more significant than yourselves, he says, verse 4, let each of you not look only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. So you've got to understand, humility, the world's definition of it is a low view of self. But humility, as in the Bible, it's not thinking of or thinking less of yourself, like putting yourself down, a pity party, oh, woe is me, I'm not very good, I can't do things, and... I'm just a doormat for everybody, and I'm going to let everyone walk over me. He says, not, don't look only to yourselves, because you've got to take care of yourselves, right? He says, but also to the interests of others. So humility is not thinking of yourself, or less of yourself. Here we go. But thinking of yourself less. There we go. There it is. All right. I'm trying to unravel this whole thing in my mind here. But anyways, like that's really what it is. Like You're not invaluable, like worthless. Jesus died for you. Right? He's called you. He's raised you from the grave. He has purpose for you. Of course you have value, but he's like, in your pursuit of life, you got to take care of yourself. Don't look only to your own interests, but you got to take care of yourself to some degree. But he says also to others. So when we become a Christian, we got to understand that part of the call is taking care of others. It's just part of it. it comes with it. Right? Like if you don't want to help other people and whatever, it's like, well, that's pride manifesting in yourself. Well, I don't want to. I'm, I just want to do me. That's pride. Right? I don't got time for that. That's pride. It's like, no, literally the call of the Christian is that you would have humility, that you would not only serve yourself, but you would serve others in many different ways. It might look small. It might be big ways, whatever it may be, but being led by the Spirit, helping each other out, right? Verse 5, he says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And he says, have this mind, right? This is the one mind that was mentioned in verse 2. Have this mindset. This is it, which is yours in Christ Jesus, because this is the mindset of Jesus. Right? And you've got to understand to have this mindset, you, you can have it through receiving Jesus, the Holy Spirit in you, right? And he will transform you, right? Romans 12 Two, Paul says that we would be transformed by the renewal of our mind. That's not just refresh, like, you know, on your web browser, you just refresh and it's the same page. No, literally, the, the renewed mind is a mind that's made new. Jesus wants to make a new mind, a new heart in you. He'll give you new desires. 
And this is the mind of Christ. He goes on, verse 6, he says, "...who, though he was in the form of God," this is Jesus, "...did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped." Right? And so this is a weighty subject. Probably shouldn't have bitten off more than I could chew with this. But this is kind of a, a text that gets people into some messy waters in a bit. But you've got to understand in context what Paul's trying to tell us. He's trying to tell us and make an example, a point about humility. Right? And what he's doing here is he's going to the greatest example of all, Jesus Christ. There is no one greater. Right, and so what he's trying to tell us is this is the greatest example of humility. And so what he's not trying to tell us, people will take this text and be like, well, was Jesus God or whatever? And they try to dissect it and they get into this, I don't know, this muddy pit of messy doctrine. I guess I'll say that, right? But what I want to tell you is like Paul is, all he's trying to tell us is that Jesus is God and he became a man. And he's trying to make that such a big deal so we can understand. He says he was in the form of God. It's not that he was a copy of God, right? It's like if you go make a copy of an original piece of artwork, like that's kind of in the form. I think people try to think that. But the word form, it means the very nature or character. It's the very nature and character of God. So what Paul's saying, though he was in the form of God, he was and is the very nature. Not a copy, not some you know, little phony look-alike, Jesus is God. you got to understand that. It's not what he's saying. He says he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped because Jesus humbled himself. He has his, his divinity, if you will, and just remember that Jesus is, was in heaven pre-coming to earth. He was on the throne, right? He was ruling and reigning. Things were great, and then he didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped because he humbled himself, and I think of it this way, like he didn't count it. Like, yeah, I am God, right? But I'm not going to count that. I'm going to go, and I'm going to serve, right? It's like, I'm, you know what I'm saying? It's like if you had, I don't know, playing basketball and someone's like, hey, you know, you can use this handicap and you can have five extra points or whatever. You're like, but I'm not going to count that. I know that I could. He's like, but well, I'm not going to count that. And it says that he emptied himself. Verse 7, this is Jesus, emptied himself. New King James says that he made himself of no reputation, Right, some people will get into a messy pit of doctrine, too, with that one, where he emptied himself. It's like, well, did Jesus just, like, he gave all his superpowers away and he didn't have any anymore? Like, no, of course not. We see Jesus literally in the New Testament doing miracles, bringing the dead back to life. Lazarus, come forth. How do people, how dead people come back to life if he wasn't God? Right? You're going to tell me, oh, well, he was just a good man, a prophet, or whatever. Like, no, he was God. How do you know what the thoughts are of people. He knew people's thoughts before they came. He was God. He is God. And so it says he emptied himself. I like New King James, made himself of no reputation because he took the humblest road you could possibly take. God Almighty, creator of the universe. I said this a couple weeks ago. He's the creator of the universe, right? Made everything. All the galaxies that were like, whoa, man, that's crazy. We found a new galaxy. If you guys are space nerds, it's just really fun. And it's like, we don't really know anything, it seems like, because we're always finding something new. But it's like, he literally God made all of that, and he made everything down to like the microcellular level. Very precise. Like where this is the body just works in these amazing ways. And we don't even understand the body when we're right here. Right? God is so amazing, vast, creative, and yet he became a man to serve us. The most humble road you can possibly take, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. It says, um, verse 8, And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So he humbled himself, God, became a man, he made himself of no reputation, and if you just know the story of Jesus, like Jesus, God became a man, John 1, 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, but literally Jesus, God in the flesh, was born in a barn, like in a manger, 
in a place that you shouldn't be like born in. Like that's not a place to have kids. Maybe like the horses and cows can have kids in the barn, but not a human being. That's where Jesus was born, in a barn in, in Bethlehem, right? It's not long later, they had to flee to Egypt because King Herod wanted to kill all the baby boys in around that place. And so they flee, right? And then in the midst of this, right, right before or during Jesus' birth, you know, Mary and Joseph, they had an interesting relationship. Right, because they weren't quite married yet, and then all of a sudden Joseph's like, "Wait a second, is, are you pregnant right now?" Because that wasn't me, <laughs> and uh, they were on the verge of divorce. Seriously, it said Joseph sought to quietly leave or divorce or or whatever part from Mary, but then an angel came and intervened and said, "No, Joseph, here's the story. God is bringing His Messiah through you, the promised Son that's been promised in the Old Testament." And Joseph's like, "Okay, sure. Oh, you know what I mean? Like, who am I to argue?" Right? That's the family dynamic Jesus came into. Humble, right? Not this great family and everything, silver spoon in his mouth type of thing. No, quite the opposite, right? Um, they go to Egypt, they come back, and then Jesus, basically, he's, he um, is raised up in a place called Nazareth, in a place that you and I, we wouldn't ever have heard of it in our whole life had it not been for Jesus, because it was such a nowhere place. And one person said in the Bible, can anything good come from Nazareth? Because it was just like... No, what is Nazareth? Right? And you're going to tell me the Messiah came from Nazareth? He's so humble. And he came and he served our greatest need. Our greatest need is this. Write it down if you need to. Right? Say, our greatest need is forgiveness of sins. Our greatest need is salvation. Right? Our greatest need is reconciliation with God Almighty. We can't do that. We're broken in, our, in and of ourselves. But Jesus literally became a man... CEO of heaven and earth and everything we know came down to mop up and clean up our sinful, messy situation. Man, who does that? God does. Jesus does. And he was obedient to death. And I just think he points this out, and we need to emphasize it. Not just any death, but death on a cross. It's the worst way to die. I forget what the word is. Something ology, people who study... Um, Ways to die and death. I mean, that's such a weird thing, but people really do it. But they say that crucifixion is the worst way to die. It's the most painful way to die out of anything there is, right? And they, there's literally a word that was created to try to describe the pain that would be experienced when you're hanging on a cross being crucified. And you know what it is? Excruciating. That's a word. They, they had to make up a new word. It's not just like, oh, this hurts. It's like, no, this is excruciating. We've got to have a big fancy word to describe how much pain would be on this cross. And so I think Paul's telling us not only did he humble himself to die, it's not just any death, right? And just like, you know what, I'm going to, I don't know, a quick and easy way to die. Like he took the most painful, but not only the most painful, he took the most shameful way to die. And it's important to know that. He's hanging on the cross for hours. Right? So he's, yeah, he's got physical pain, but he's enduring public shame all throughout that. God in the flesh on the cross. Just picture it for a minute. If you're Jesus, you're on the cross. You know you're God. You know what you're sent for. And people are mocking you. Oh, if you're God, well, why don't you come off the cross, right? For me, like this shows us our pridefulness. It's like if I was on the cross, I'm like, oh, I'm going to show you. I come right off the cross like a scary ghost on Halloween. I'll show you. Um, but Jesus humbled himself. He endured the cross. He endured the shame. He's bloody and near naked, if not naked, on the cross. He didn't even resemble a man, Scripture tells us. That's how beaten up he was. And he would be publicly shamed, ridiculed. The most painful way to die, the most shameful. Why do he do it? For us. Who does that? What other God does that? Right, other people want to talk about their God loves them, whatever. No, my God died for me and for you. <laughs> Most people don't, who don't believe that don't believe it yet. But he died for us. That's what he did for us. That's humility. Talk about putting other people's interests above your own. And I think even this is that God's interest was our, was our interest. I care so much about you, I'm going to die for you. For, uh, Philippians 2.9 it says, therefore God has highly exalted him, that is Jesus, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. There is none greater than Jesus. 
If you take notes, write it down. There is no name that is greater than Jesus. You want to make your name great, you will never be greater than Jesus. Jesus is, is the greatest of all time. He is the GOAT. You know what I'm saying? But that sounds weird because that sounds like Antichrist. That's not what he is. He's the lion and the lamb. You ever think of that? You're like, oh, he's the GOAT. You're like, that's kind of demonic in a weird way. But Jesus is the greatest, highest of all. There is none greater. You will not be greater. Satan will not be greater. Jesus is above all. Verse 10, it says, So that at the name of Jesus, check this out, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. He, what he's saying here is no one's getting out. Everyone is going to confess Jesus is Lord. He says, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And you just need to know this, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And we can either start that process humbly. Now we humble ourselves, And we're going to humble ourselves, and we're going to worship Jesus as Lord, as King, as God Almighty, because that is what He is. He's our Savior, right? Um, or... For those who have the worldview, the anthropocentric worldview, they're going to be humbled one day. And they will stand before Jesus one day. And they will bow, despite what they think. They will be humbled. See, we can either humble ourselves or we will be humbled. Choice is ours. And they will be humbled and they will confess that Jesus is Lord. And I think of that day, man, there's either, it's going to be the most exciting day when, for us who believe, and we're like, that's my God, that's my King, He died for me, He did everything for me, everything revolves around Him, everything is for Him, I can't wait to worship You, Lord, with just face to the ground, I don't know what's going to happen in heaven, God, it's going to be amazing, but then it's going to be the most terrifying day for someone who never knew Jesus, and all of a sudden they're like, you're real? I didn't know. And no one's going to be able to say that. Well, I didn't know. He's going to be like, man, creation tells of my greatness and my glory. Right? But all atheists and scientists want to just try to explain it away and say, oh, no, it's just this and that. Um, I had a thought the other day. It's not in my notes, but I just want to put it out there. Um, you know how people are like, oh, we evolved from apes or we evolved from whatever. Uh, I just thought it was interesting. Why does everyone just think that we evolved from something rather than that just explains that we came from the same creator? I don't know. I just had that idea where it's like literally they're like, oh, well, we must have evolved from this. Or maybe we just have the same creator, right? You go look at someone's art that just makes a bunch of different art. It's very similar. It's not all the same. They're just creative in their own way, but they have their own style. And I just thought that's interesting. But every knee will bow. That was a fun fact for you. Um, if, I don't know, hopefully that made sense. Every knee will bow. Some, it'll be the most exciting day, some the most terrifying, but it will happen, as we talked about last week, with things heating up in Israel and just in the world in general. Maybe it's going to happen soon. Maybe it won't happen for a long time, but there is no better day than today to know Jesus because we just, you never know. Don't put it off. Know Jesus today. Humble yourself. Welcome him in. Serve him. Worship him as king because he is you're going to do it one day. You might as well start now. Um, but verse 12, let's keep moving here. Um, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. He's saying, if, you, um, if I'm here with you or I'm gone, obey. Doesn't matter, right? We kind of talked about that um, in chapter 2 when he says that if, I'm, if I come to see you or I'm absent, live in a manner worthy of the gospel. He's repeating himself a bit. But he's like, if we're truly followers of Jesus, we should be pursuing Jesus, and no matter who is with us or who isn't with us. Some people are really good at pursuing Jesus and playing Christian, right, when all of the Christian people are around them. Right? But what about when you're out in the world and you're with a whole bunch of people who don't believe in Jesus? Right? It shouldn't matter who is or isn't with you. You should be pursuing Jesus. And Paul's like, just obey Jesus no matter what. Right? And I, and I want to say the same thing to us today. No matter what, if you're here at church on Sunday or tomorrow, Monday, and the day is really bad and you're around a bunch of people at your work who hate Jesus, pursue Jesus. Whether one of us are there or not, or your Christian buddy at work, oh man, they didn't come today, I really need you. No, you have Jesus too. 
You have the Holy Spirit. Pursue Jesus. He's saying, pursue Jesus. And he says, work out your own salvation. And I love this. And this is one of those another messy um, doctrinal type things. But work out your own salvation. What he's not saying is work for your salvation. He's saying work out your salvation. You've been given salvation. Much like a bo- your body, right? If I'm like, hey, go work out your body. It's not like, oh, well, I made my body. and I, It's like, no, I'm, you're literally working out what you've been given. When you've received Jesus, you receive salvation. And now Paul, all he's simply saying is work out, exercise your faith. James says faith without deeds is dead, right? Faith without works is dead. Not that our faith leads to salvation, but no, our, our works are a response or a fruit even of salvation. Work out your salvation. I love that he says, work out your own salvation. Because you really can't work out the salvation of other people. Right? You can try to lead people to, to Jesus, tell them the truth, all that stuff, but at the end of the day, it's up to them if they want to bow their knee and worship and confess Jesus as Lord now, or if they're going to wait till you know, over time. And... Um, They'll find out then, but you can work out your salvation today. It says, work out your own salvation. Don't worry so much about others. And I think of Jesus when he says the, uh, the parable or the story, and he says that don't, you know, when you try to, uh, I forget what verse it is exactly, but he says, um, we try to pick out the speck out of our brother's eye. Meanwhile, we got a log in our own, you know what I'm talking about? Like, oh, let me get that out of your eye. And then literally Jesus is like, you got a tree branch sticking in yours, bro. Like, how are you going to do that? But like, so work out your own salvation. It's like literally work out on yourself. Get that tree branch, that log, that hypocriticalness out of your life. And then go help take the speck out of your brother's eye. Work on your salvation. Work out your salvation. Right? How do we do it? Verse 13, it says, for it is God who works in you. How do I do that? How am I going to work it out? It's like, well, God's going to do it. God's going to work in you, it says, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. So with God with you, that's, that's how you're going to work out what's in you. God gives you the strength. He gives you the self-control. He gives you the motivation, the heart to serve, the wisdom of what to do, the humble mind, right? God's the one doing it in you, but He wants to do that stuff through you. But we got to be obedient. And what that requires is like we got to move. Right? It's been said before by many, you can't steer a parked car. Right? It's like, man, you can sit there and, and you ever notice, like, man, the steering wheel, like, especially when it's off, like it doesn't even move. Even like an old school car that didn't have power steering, anyone ever driven one of those? Come on, some, okay, good, there we go. We got a few, right? But it, it doesn't have power steering, right? But like when it's going, it's like you can actually steer. It's a little harder than now today, but like when it's moving, you can still go in a direction. But when it's sitting there, you're like, oh, man, like you got to like, really crank on this thing, right? The younger people, whoever, I'm young too, but I, I've driven those before. But um, you can't steer a parked car. It's like literally, we're like, let's just go. Right? God's like, just do something and I'm going to come through. Like get moving and I'm going to direct you, right? God's word says that his word is like a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. Like as we're moving, he's going to show us like, oh, don't go there. You're going to trip up. Don't do that or go this direction. He's going to steer us, but we got to do something. And he says that he works in us to will and to work for his good pleasure. Verse 14, he says, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Right? Earlier Paul said, do no things, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Now he's saying do all things. And that Greek word is the word pas, P-A-S or P-A-Z. You know what it means? It means all. It means everything. It means this whole completed everything. Do all things without grumbling or or disputing. In other words, without complaining, without arguing. Oh man, that's a tall order, Paul. You don't know my life, Paul. You don't know what I got to go through, Paul. Without complaining, without disputing, without arguing. That's hard. And think of it this way. Wouldn't it be nice, those of you who have kids, if your kids never argued or complained about anything? You're just like, hey, can you clean up your room? Yes, dad. Um, oh, okay. Hey, can you brush your teeth? Yes, Dad. Hey, can you get ready for bed and we're going to go to bed right now? Yes, Dad. Right? Wouldn't that be sweet? <laughs> that would be so amazing. But it, it's not usually like that. Why? Can I have five more minutes? Like, I just want another minute or I don't want to do that. I don't want to get ready. You know what I mean? It's like we play this whole arguing game. But wouldn't it be nice if, if it was 
if they just did what we asked all the time. And Paul's telling us, telling them, wouldn't it be amazing if God's people just got along, acted like Christians, acted like followers of Jesus who were humble in mind, and they didn't complain about everything and argue with one another? Right? He's telling them, he's like, act like a Christian. Be like Jesus, right? There's no, yeah, but, or what about this, right? It's like, no, you're either following Jesus or you're not. And following Jesus means, again, loyalty to Jesus, but then also unity with one another. Like, you're going to get the church with it. We're the bride of Christ, right? So if you're like, oh, but I want to just live with, I want to follow Jesus, but I don't want to do anything with the church, you're going to have problems because that's not how he designed us to be. It's like, we got to have unity with one another. And he says, that you got to stop. You, you can't have it. Do all things without complaining. And he says, verse 15, he says, this is why he says to do it, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Why do all things without complaining or disputing or arguing? So that you can be blameless in the sight of the world. So that you can be innocent children of God in the sight of the world. See, here's the thing. The world knows that the Christians, the Christians should be different. The world knows that. But you know what they also know is that the church, the Christian, is often hypocritical. That's why they don't want anything to do with it, right? When we're like, oh, but I love Jesus and you should come to church. Jesus changed my life. But you're at the bar with them Friday night getting drunk just like them and you're sleeping around or being foolish, doing stupid stuff, prideful things just like them. When we're sitting here acting like them, telling them about Jesus, but we look exactly the same, they're probably like, well, this Jesus of yours doesn't sound very great because it's not working out because you're always with me doing the same thing I'm doing. Right? He's like, don't be grumbling and complaining. That's for the world. That's for the non-believer. We can't judge them. Don't get upset with the world. The world is just going to be worldly. So you can't, when we get upset, I can't believe they did that. Really? They don't know Jesus. They don't know his word. They don't have the Holy Spirit. Right? So when they act foolish and selfish, I mean, that's just what the world does. But Paul's like, that's not us. Don't complain. He's like complaining. And what he's saying, complaining is staining. Complaining is staining. It stains your witness. If you hang around a bunch of non-believers, and he says that, right? We're in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, or dark, um, what do you say? Um, crooked and twisted generation at whom we shine as lights to the world. He's saying we're going to be in the world. Part of the Christian's duty is that we're in the world. It's not that we just retreat and we get, let's go buy a bunch of property on this place and we're just going to hang out here until Jesus comes back, right? No, that's not our goal. That's not our mission, Jesus died so that we could live in the world as light. We live in the world, but we're not of the world. I heard one pastor say it's like it's the, the boat, right? A boat analogy. The boat's supposed to be in the, in the water, but the water's not supposed to be in the boat. Right? The Christian's supposed to be in the world, but the world's not supposed to be in the Christian. Right? It's just like that. And so how do we do it? Well, one way is we don't complain. Because you go out there into the world and all you complain about is, man, I can't believe these people are like, well, aren't, don't, aren't they like your Christian friends? Yeah, but man, I just can't stand them, right? Or whatever. Or man, you know, following Jesus is so hard. If all we do is just complain and argue and we dispute about these things, and then you're like, hey, you want to come to church with me on Sunday? Right? If you're a non-believer, I'd be like, no, I really don't. Like, that sounds terrible. Like, you just complain about all these people. It's like, and so Paul's saying, don't complain. Don't argue. Um, be blameless, innocent, children of God without blemish. And you got to understand that the audience, our audience is the world, and they are, are always watching. Again, they know something should be different about a Christian, about a believer, but experience often tells them nothing is different because Christians don't pursue living a different life. Right? But we are in the world. And a uh, verse to look up, Louis, if you want to pull this up. This is Jesus' prayer in John 17, 15 through 19, you should read this, right? This is Jesus' prayer to the Father. This is shortly before he actually goes to be um, scourged and then crucified. But he's praying to the Father. Verse 15 says, I do not ask that you take them, us, the followers of Jesus, out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. So Jesus is even saying, I'm not asking you to take 
the people out of the world. I'm just asking that you would protect them, Father. He says, verse 16, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Verse 17, sanctify them in truth. The word sanctified means set apart, make holy. So Jesus is like, sanctify them, set them apart, Father, make them holy. And he says, your word is truth. And we'll get to this in a second. I'm talking about his word. Your word is truth. And he says, as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in the truth. Our mission is to be a representative of Jesus Christ to the world among whom you shine as lights in the world. Right? But when we complain, we're dimming that light. Right? It's almost like, I don't know, if, I wish I would have made an example. You get this light. I have this light at home. It's kind of like this light, man. It's super bright, and you look at it, and it almost blinds you for a second. But it's a floodlight, and that's what it's supposed to do. But it's like literally like when we complain, it'd be like me just putting one sheet of paper over it. The first sheet of paper, not a big deal. Right? It's still going to... Still gonna, it'll be a little bit dimmer, but it's like then we complain again, another sheet of paper. And after a few of those, all of a sudden this light is significantly dampened almost all the way down to like as if it weren't even on, as we just keep complaining, arguing, disputing with one another. And that's what it does to our witness. Little by little, it just dims the light. Little by little by little. And Jesus says, though, you're the light of the world. You should shine like the light of the world. Shine bright out there, right? So verse 16, we'll, we'll move on. We're almost done, guys. Paul says, holding fast to the word of life. Right? So after he says that, don't complain and argue and all that stuff. He says, but hold fast to the word of life. The word of life is God's word. It, it brings life. It's the Bible, right? If you don't have one of these, talk to us afterwards. We will get you a Bible today. It's what you need to have. If you don't have a Bible app, Download one, they're free, right? But we'd love to give you a physical, tangible copy of a Bible if you need it in your life because you need to read it. You want to understand God and what He's done and what He's made you to be? Like, you need to understand Him. The best way to understand Him is to read His Word. Just like trying to get to know somebody new, if you want to understand them, get to know them, you got to talk with them. And with God, it's no different. And this is His way of talking with us. He's written a whole 66 book. Um, book for us to read to get to know him so he says hold fast to the word of life god's word is the word of life read it learn it love it live it right i think about it this way he says hold fast it's saying to cling to it don't let it go no matter what no matter what happens in this world no matter what happens in your life don't let god's word go he's hold fast to it. cling to the word of life and I think of it this way too, uh, David, he writes in Psalm 119, if you haven't read Psalm 119, it's the longest chapter in the Bible, so I'll just preface it with that, so I'm not like tricking you, like, oh man, he didn't tell me it was, you know, a hundred and what are, some odd verses, but it's all about God's Word. It's all about God's Word. If you read it, just looking through it, he talks about your precepts, your laws, your promises, right, all throughout it. And one of the first things he says is, how can a young man keep his way pure? And he says, by guarding it according to your word to God. Right? So, and he talks about that I've hidden your word in my heart, that I might not sin against you. And so when you want to understand like God and how am I to live and what am I to do, man, you, just, you hide it in your heart. Right? He says in Psalm 119, that verse where he says, your word is a lamp unto my feet, a light to my path. That's Psalm 119. I forget which verse exactly, but it's all about God's word and how just, I mean, amazing it is. And you need to know it. Memorize it. Psalm 1 says, blessed is the man who meditates on the law of the Lord day and night, that he's like a, a tree planted by streams of water whose, whose fruit comes in season, his leaf never withers, and all that he does, it prospers. But you're not going to see that if you don't have the Word of God. If you're not holding fast to the Word of God. Meditate on it. Memorize it. I was thinking about it the other day, man. There's so many verses that I feel like I don't remember ever memorizing. But I can only like, I mean, it's the Lord for one, the Holy Spirit who brings them up. But I'm like, the only time that I might have ever memorized that or something was as a kid. As a kid, I go to Sunday school. My aunt at one point was the uh, second grade Sunday school teacher, and she would have candy 
and everybody loves candy, right? So you do your memory verse, you get some candy. So on the way to church, I got my little index card, and I'm like, for God so loved the world that he sent his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3.16, right? And then I get to, to my aunt's class. For God so loved the world, you know, like I would memorize it, but I wanted candy, but it was a good trick. And the only thing I can think of that sometimes these verses just come out of nowhere. I'm like, I don't remember. I haven't studied that in years, if not over a decade. I'm like, maybe it was when I was a kid, just memorizing it. And it's stuck in my heart and God's pulling it out at the right time. All right, memorize scripture, hold fast to it. Verse 17, he says, even if I'm to be poured out as a drink offering, Paul's like, if I'm to be poured out, like just fully like given over, maybe killed upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, he says, I'm glad. Even if th this happens, I'm glad and I rejoice with you all. And he says, likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. To wrap this whole thing up, humility. We need humility. Pride is the opposite of humility. Pride destroys. Pride feels good, but it's poisonous. It will rot you from the inside out slowly but surely. But humility, it hurts up front, but it will heal you, and it will lead you from the inside out. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. He says, humble yourself before the Lord at the right time. He will exalt you. Right, and talks about in um, Zechariah, don't despise the day of small beginnings or humble beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. I just want to encourage you to just have a humble mind, have a humble heart, seek to serve others, put other people's interests above your own. You're like, you know what, but I really want to do, do something else, right? But like literally it's something that takes five minutes. Maybe it's like holding the door, like you're in a rush, but you see someone coming and literally I'm just going to put your need above mine. I want to go home, but I'm going to hold the door for an extra 10 seconds so that you can come through and have a little bit easier of a day. You know what I mean? Like just little things. And of course there's big things too, but have a humble mind, the humble mind of Jesus who gave it all for us on the cross. It's what Jesus did for us, and the thing about it, being a Christian, he's calling us to follow him, and he says, pick up your cross and follow me. Pick up your cross. It's going to require humility, right? Pick up your cross. You're dying to yourself. It's a, it's a painful thing. And he's not saying get on a cross literally, although with like Peter, he's like, you're going to die in a similar way like I did, right? But he's saying pick up your cross. It's going to be hard. It's going to be painful. It's going to be publicly shameful at times, but he says, follow me, because that takes humility. And in the right time, he will exalt you. You've got to understand, God is a promise keeper. He's not trying to pull any tricks on you. He's not trying to lead you down a road and say, ha ha, I got you. No, he's trying to lead you to life. And if he did it, we've got to understand that's what he's calling us to do as well. We are followers of him. What did Jesus do? He lived, he died, he resurrected, and he's calling us to live for him one day we will die, but we will be resurrected and be following him and with him in, uh, forever and eternity. Amen?